So in this video, you will learn what is DDoS and the AWS services you can use to protect yourself from this and other threats. A quick agenda. First up, we will talk about what is DDoS and how DDoS attacks are categorized. This won't be specific to AWS. Next, there are two AWS services that provide protection from DDoS on their own and working together. We will discuss their high-level capabilities, their role in protection from DDoS, and the basics of their cost model. So, let's get started. What is DDoS? First, DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. So DDoS is the act of flooding a target with traffic, preventing legitimate users from accessing a system as that system is either impaired or gone down as a result of this flood. The concept of distributed refers to that many of these attacks come from not one, but either dozens, hundreds, thousands, or more compromised systems. As an analogy, a thousand people show up at a store. 900 of those people are not customers, but you can't tell who those are as they're just coming in. Even if these 900 people are just browsing, actual customers will have a harder time shopping and will take longer to check out, or you might have to turn away some people at the door, including actual customers. When this happens in reality, the impact to your business could be lost sales, customer trust, or even a direct financial impact such as missing an SLA or a regulatory requirement. DDoS attacks are accomplished using a number of techniques known as attack vectors. Attack vectors can technically be of any layer on the OSI model, however, the majority of them fall into two groups. The first group is at the network and transport layer, or layer three and four. These are commonly referred to as network or infrastructure layer attacks. These are packet level floods and frequently use an amplification technique to increase the volume directed at their target. Let's look at an example to visualize how this works and elaborate on what I mean by amplification. Here, we have an attacker who has constructed a valid DNS UDP packet. Note they have specified the target's IP address as the source, not their own. Let's say that this packet is 64 bytes in size. We're gonna send this packet to a legitimate public DNS server. On our diagram, this is the reflector. The DNS server resolves the query and sends a response to the source IP it saw from the packet. This is the target's IP, not the attacker's. The response to a large DNS query could easily be 3,400 bytes. That would be a 50-fold increase in volume going to the target versus what the attacker sent themselves. This is amplification. And remember, DDoS attacks commonly are distributed. Imagine if instead of just one compromised system, I had a thousand systems, each sending 10,000 packets to various DNS servers every second. The target in this example would experience 30 gigabytes per second of traffic. The second group is at the application layer and referred to as application layer attacks. Technically, this can be any application, but we will be explicitly talking about the HTTP application. Application layer floods send requests, not packets. This flood might be sheer volume or volume along with some other attribute in the request, causing the target to become exhausted more easily. One example of this is called a cache bursting attack. In this attack vector, the requests use variations in their query string to prevent a CDN or content delivery network from serving content from its cache. Instead, it will reach back to the origin server for every single request, which is probably not designed to handle that volume. HTTP floods can achieve hundreds of thousands or even millions of requests per second. In extreme cases, these have reached hundreds of millions of requests per second. Let's do a visualization on these. Pretend we have a web server, and we'll say it can handle at most 50,000 requests per second of static pages, and maybe 500 login requests per second. Day to day, this type of server maybe peaks at, we'll call it, say, 30,000 requests a second. If all of a sudden an attacker starts sending 5 million requests a second, 99% of all these requests are going to either be extremely slow, return errors, or just outright fail. In theory, this attack could come from one huge compromised system sending every single one of these requests. But more likely, it could be a thousand or let's say 10,000 smaller compromised system 
where each one only needs to send 500 requests a second to generate this load. There isn't a single IP address you can block, so without some other way of detecting this, your server is going to accept every request and at least try to process them. Let's add another dimension to this. What if that attacker did some recon, and now they're going to target your login page? It only takes 1% or 50,000 requests a second to cause the same degree of impact. Now, this is all a dramatic simplification of all the actual complexity that goes on in reality, but it gives us a good visual of the overall threat we need to protect from. It also will allow you to understand how the AWS services will be able to detect and mitigate these threats. All right, let's get started with our first service, AWS Shield. AWS Shield is responsible for detecting and mitigating infrastructure layer attacks. Detection and mitigation are automatic, and depending on the targeted endpoint and attack vector, mitigation happens in less than a second to a few minutes. When AWS Shield blocks, it is blocking packets. The targeted resource never sees these packets, meaning even if millions or billions of packets are flying at that resource, it isn't experiencing a flood. AWS Shield has two tiers. AWS Shield Standard is always present, protecting all public IPs on AWS all the time. There's nothing you need or can configure. AWS Shield Advance improves on what AWS Shield Standard provides. Going forward, we will only be talking about AWS Shield Advance. First, you need to subscribe to AWS Shield Advance. For now, we're just gonna cover the basics where this is how you subscribe. We walk through subscribing and configuring AWS Shield Advance in a later video. Once you are subscribed, you can select which resources you want to enable enhanced protection and visibility for. Protected resources have lower thresholds, meaning mitigations kick in faster. Today, you can protect CloudFront distributions, RAP53 hosted zones, global accelerators, application and classic load balancers, as well as EIPs. You can also protect EC2 instances and network load balancers by protecting EIPs associated with those resources. As a Shield Advanced customer, you can reach out to AWS SRT or Shield Response Team through a support case. SRT provides live assistance during an active DDoS event. You can also configure proactive engagement where SRT will reach out to you when certain criteria have been met. For resources that you choose to protect, AWS Shield Advance publishes CloudWatch metrics when it detects a DDoS based on the attack vector by resource and mitigation status by resource. In addition, AWS Shield Advance publishes DDoS events in the Shield console. These events correspond to the DDoS detected metric we just saw. You can use these events or metrics to trigger notifications or centralize these events using Security Hub. We will talk about the Security Hub integration in our next video, as well as talk about this in more detail when we talk about operations and monitoring. Let's go back to our analogy with those thousand people all going into a shop at once. People in this example represent packets. AWS Shield detects this DDoS event and doesn't let these people into the parking lot or exit off the highway to begin with. This depends on how AWS Shield mitigates the threat. Let's finish up and talk about the cost model for AWS Shield. AWS Shield Standard has no costs, it's just always there. AWS Shield Advance has a flat monthly fee per organization. Note, this is not a fee per account. In addition, there is a usage fee based on the data transfer out of protected resources. Note, the global services, CloudFront and Global Accelerator are less per gig than the regional services like load balancers and EIPs. AWS Shield Advance includes standard AWS WAF costs when it is used on protective resources. We deep dive into this cost model and how to create an accurate estimate in another video. Let's get to our second service, AWS WAF. First, WAF stands for Web Application Firewall. These types of firewalls work at the application layer, in this case, the HTTP application. In addition to DDoS protection, they also can mitigate web vulnerabilities and exploit attempts. AWS WAF evaluates requests, not packets like AWS Shield or a non-WAF firewall does. With AWS WAF, you create a web ACL. A web ACL is an ordered list of rules that determine what action is taken for each request. WAF rules can evaluate a number of attributes about each request. 
you can inspect things such as the URI, header, name, or value, query string, body, source IP, or IP metadata such as geolocation. From here, we specify how to evaluate that component. The most common option is string matches such as ex is exactly, begins with, or regex patterns. For example, this rule here is when the URI of a request is exactly forward slash. You can also evaluate the size of an attribute, such as the size of a body or query string. Rules can also have multiple statements, including and, or, and not logic. Once a rule evaluates true and the action is not count, this is the action that this request will take. Later rules are not evaluated. Once you have created a WebACL, you will associate it with one or more resources. Web ACLs can be associated with ALBs, CloudFront distributions, and API gateways. The full list can be seen here. Note, CloudFront can only be selected when the Web ACL is created in the global region. While you can and certainly will want to create your own WAF rules, there are also a number of Amazon managed rules, commonly referred to as AMRs, that you can leverage. AMRs are WAF rules created and maintained by AWS. They are AMRs that cover everything from general threats, threats against specific OSs such as Linux, applications such as WordPress. They are AMRs that focus on detecting and protecting from bot and fraud activities. Finally, AMRs allow you to leverage Amazon's threat intelligence. For example, one AMR allows you to block known DDoSing IP addresses. There are also a number of third-party WAF rule providers. These function sort of similar to AMRs, except they are maintained by those third parties, they use AWS Marketplace for licensing and have their own costs and cost models. This is not a topic we are going to be covering. In practice, you'll likely want to use AMRs and custom rules. We cover all the available AMRs, everything around creating custom rules, recommendations on what rules to use, or at least evaluate in a later video. So how does AWS WAF actually help defend from a DDoS attack? Let's go back to our example web server that could handle 50,000 requests a second of static pages. Let's place an ALB ahead of the web server so we can associate a web ACL. For now, let's assume all the DDoSing IPs can be identified with one of the Amazon Threat Intelligence AMRs and we have this in place within our web ACL and set to block. When AWS WAF blocks these requests, they don't get past the ALB and WAF. The web server only needs to handle legitimate requests while the ALB and AWS WAF block the flood. The common theme for both AWS Shield Advance and AWS WAF is we are blocking the packet or request ahead of our application. As a generalization, blocking traffic earlier on is more compute and network efficient, meaning we can either absorb or block at much greater scales. AWS customers using these services successfully defend from DDoS events that measure in terabytes per second or hundreds of millions requests per second. Lastly, let's talk about how AWS WAF and AWS Shield Advance work together. While the core of AWS Shield is packet level inspection and mitigation, as a managed service, AWS Shield Advance coordinates with AWS WAF to analyze your traffic at the application layer. AWS Shield Advance establishes a baseline based on the application context it now has. This is far more accurate to detect HTTP floods than simply looking at packets. Optionally, you can have AWS Shield Advance react and create rules in your Web ACL as a response to detecting an anomaly during a DDoS event. A strong Web ACL configuration is best, but having this additional reactive layer can automatically block things that might make it through. That concludes this video. You should now have a basic understanding of what a DDoS is, what attack vectors are, and how attacks can be categorized as infrastructure or application layer attacks. You should begin to see how AWS WAF and AWS Shield Advance will protect you from DDoS attacks and high level know what they can do. Our next video discusses several additional AWS services that are commonly used along with ARP2 services but are not DDoS detection and mitigation tools themselves.